Just showing a quick demo of Ian's new code for his uh, Arduino-based uh, Admega 328P open source clock. Kind of looks like my previous video here, except I've got the new firmware on there. And I have one other feature I've added. I have this real-time clock module connected via I2C to the clock. But I took that off and I put on uh, the Wi-Fi module on ESP3366. Uh, I think that's the number. I'm not good on those numbers, but it's a, it's a 12E version of the module that has a lot more I.O. and a built-in USB port for easy programming. Once it's set up, though, and connected to your Wi-Fi, it blinks. And thereafter, it goes out to a time server. And Ian maintains a publicly accessible proprietary time server that can be accessed by anybody with the clock. I've created my own, I'll show that in a moment, but that goes out and gets the time and places in the RTC and then uh, updates the um, time on the clock every minute. So that works out kind of nicely. The new software, as you can see, every minute displays the uh, date now, optionally, and the date information rolls in right to left and scrolls, times square sign style, from the right to left, and then after a few seconds of displaying the date, it uses sort of a slot machine effect to um, return back to the time to, uh, time display again. So that's very cool, and those are two new effects that are configurable. Uh, in addition to that, Ian's updated the uh, the uh, the web page that allows the clock to be set with its correct time server. It allows Wi-Fi settings to be set up. And it also allows uh, configuring various clock options. Not quite all of them, but most of them. So um, let me just demonstrate here. There's a button, single button on here to control it. If I press it once, it shows the date. If I press it twice, it shows the state of the LDR or the light dependent resistor, which is off now. This is the firmware revision 48. Get back to that. I press it again and shows the first two octets of the IP address of that Wi-Fi module. So in this case, it's 192.168, my local LAN IP. And there it is. And then the second two octets are 14. So if I type that address into my web browser, I will be communicating with the web server that's actually uh, in the memory of this tiny little Wi-Fi module. Very cool. And uh, here it is. So um, you can see, let me just get back to it. Here you can see I've got the, the base address here is on my local LAN. And the first thing that comes up is the, uh, the, uh, the various pages, the summary sheet. Summary sheet shows that IP address. It shows the MAC address of the Wi-Fi module. It shows the wireless LAN that I am connected to. And then it shows the time server that the clock is connected to. Now, you can see I've got a local IP address in the URL rather than Ian's, um, Ian's server in Zurich. So I'm running my own time server and that just happens to be directly under the screen here so I can show it to you. That's a Raspberry Pi 2 sitting on top of what is a radar receiver. Um, this, the radar receiver I'll just mention quickly is connected to an antenna on the roof and it picks up and tra uh, uh, transponder transmissions from commercial um, aircraft equipped with ADSB transponders, this new technology that's being rolled out worldwide. And it picks up the position data and then plots it. So I basically have an air traffic control display on my computer screen with direct signals coming in from aircraft out to about 300 miles distant from my, my house. So the processing is done from that receiver by the Pi up there, then made available on a UDP port that the uh, computer can display. I also have some home automation stuff running on there, a little JSON server that interacts with Siri on my iPhone so I can give voice commands to various devices in the house. And I've just added an additional function or server onto that, which is the uh, time server function which has basically no overhead or no load on it. Now that unit, uh, the little Pi running a version of uh, Linux, is also disciplined by a local NTP server that's operating on my LAN that um, 
is used for a lightning detection network I'm a, a part of, but it also has the side effect of providing local MTP services to all my devices. So that takes the MTP from the, my GPS upstairs into that box, Linux box, uh, picks it up here, sets the time on Linux, and then uh, the server software on the Pi picks that up and then sends it out to the clock every minute. <laughs> so kind of indirect, but it works great. And the uh, time is quite accurate. I've got a second clock over here. This is a different design. I've had this about 12 years. Uh, it has a built-in, uh, well, not built-in, it has a GPS board that I wired into it, an old Motorola cellular base station board, and that has a, uh, a GPS antenna on the window sill here. And the time here always agrees with the, uh, the uh, server clock within about a second, so the processing delay is is visible, but it's not extreme. It never varies by more than about a quarter to a half a second. Uh, so it's quite accurate, it really works well. I did hack in a direct um, NTP service into this Wi-Fi module just for a, a proof of concept and it works, but it makes the configuration a bit more problematic and there's some delays while it syncs up to the NTP server because of the way the protocol works. So Ian's method is actually a lot faster, even if it requires a, a proprietary method to make, it, to make it work. Back on the software here, you can see on the top, there's a configure time server, which I've already shown. That's where you would set it up. It takes a, a two position or three position location argument, which again is nice. It calculates the offset for you. You don't have to Enter that as a separate parameter as you would with MTP. Uh, wireless LAN settings. This just allows you to reset the uh, currently connected wireless LAN, which you never need to do once it's set up. And configure clock settings is the coolest part. We're running 1.0.5 of the code, so it's got some additional functions that tie in with the version 48 features. So you can set 12, 24 hour mode, you can blank leading zeros. And uh, right now I have that on. Let me just show you, it's 9, 9 a.m. right now, thereabouts. And if I turn that off on the web server, you can see it popped up right here. I'll, um, I'll turn blanking back on, uh, set it, and the zero goes off. And you can set all sorts of other things. You can set the scroll back effect, which is that effect of tumbling back the digits from nine to zero at the end of a decade count. You can turn on the fading, cross-fading effects. You can turn off the running of the anti-cathode poisoning routines at full brightness when it's in a dim room. I have that turned off for maximum brightness. I have the light detecting resistor or the LDR photo cell turned off now. That gives the, the nice brightness. You can see if I turn that on from the web page, uh, the, it goes way dim. So for the purposes of the video here, I've got that switched off. Turn that off again. You can set up various blanking modes, which are kind of cool. The blanking mode, I'll turn that on right now. Uh, after a few seconds, we'll... Um, See, do I have it turned on? No, hold on. Blank always set. And uh, hmm, there, there we go. Well, waiting for it to blank. Blank tubes and LEDs, blank always. Oh, I know what happened. I, in an earlier demo attempt at making this video, I had bypassed the blanking, so that's still in due effect. So, um, sorry, I won't be able to do it. There's a function when the display is blanked by pressing the button a certain amount of times. The first five seconds after the initial press, you can actually bypass the blanking. And that's in effect right now. So any blanking changes I make are, are basically ignored 
until that timeout period of, of blanking disable expires. But basically the whole display and the LED turns off with the exception of the um, seconds LED down below, which continues pulsing as kind of a reminder that the clock is still powered up, which is very, very nice. So, um, very nice uh, additions that Ian's made. A bunch of bug cleanups in the code, which are appreciated. I do like the fact that it now cycles to the date automatically, and the new tumbling and scroll effects are quite nice. So looking forward to seeing uh, some additional effects as they get added on. So again, a very nice uh, integrated package with a lot of work on coding and hardware design by Ian. So many thanks for that and uh, signing off.